Well, all right. Good morning. So glad you're here. So glad you're here. We're starting a brand new series, as Paula shared a few minutes ago, called Renegades. We wanted to um, dig in right here, kind of at the beginning of the fall. School year's kind of underway. Summer's starting to get behind us, unfortunately. Um, and really think about who we are as the gathering, as a church, called together to declare the name of Jesus. That's kind of what we're, we're doing in, in this series. Um, and it's funny, you know, I get asked often. In fact, just last Sunday, um, Paula, Paula looked at me and she goes, is it okay that, that we still, you know, use David Sains and, you know, in our, in our artwork, I don't know if we have, the, we had the artwork up there, but, you know, like David's pictures on the artwork. And she's like, is that okay with you? I was like, yeah. People ask me all the time, not just from, from this church, but like friends that knew David and kind of were impacted by his ministry and, and, and wisdom or, you know, is, is that weird to you? I'm like, no. It's not weird. They're like, well, are you still going to use it? And they're, you know, use the sayings and, you know, his pictures on the internet and on the website. And I was like, yeah, of course. They're like, why? I was like, because he said good stuff. <laughs> like, why wouldn't I want to use that, you know? Like, it's like, <laughs> David, as you can tell, like, I just kind of rant and rave and then hopefully come to a point after 30 minutes. Like, David summarized things. He put it on these little nuggets. I, I don't do that, you know? So, like, I'm totally going to plagiarize from him. Half the time I'm saying stuff he said, you just don't know it. <laughs> it's okay with me that kind of his shadow still is still over us. He's the founding pastor, you know. I just have the, the distinct honor of following his, his ministry, helping expand and extend, putting my own kind of, my own kind of spin on, on things and working with his wife. And it just, it's, it's, it's awesome, you know. Because David still speaks to us today, and that's, that's a great thing. You know, um, if you don't know, you know much about Dave Foster, he was taken far too early. Um, David lived uh, his life verse out, and, and, and Paula always jokes that God literally uh, allowed this verse to become his life verse and his verse even after his life. Um, in Acts 13, it says, Now when David had served his purpose to this generation, he fell asleep. And that's unfortunately two and a half years ago what happened with David. Um, and God literally allowed that verse to be what happened with him. Uh, that's why I don't have a life verse anything like that. <laughs> My life verse is when when I open a pack of Starburst, they're all red. Like, that's my life verse. Go ahead, God, take it literal today. But even on this side of David's life here on earth, God is still allowing him to speak. And if I have one thing that I've learned from, one thing that I respect and love about David Foster, a person I never physically, personally met, but there's one thing that, that I've grown to appreciate um, is that he lived a life that still speaks after his death. That's a good thing. Because that's not a David Foster thing. He totally ripped that off from Jesus. <laughs> Because Jesus lived a life that speaks even greater after his death. Jesus came and spoke and changed lives. But it wasn't until after the cross that everything changed for everyone, for us. David lived a life that speaks even now because his Savior lived a life that speaks now. That's why we talk about Jesus so much. That's why we follow this. And, and, and in this series, that's what we're driving towards. Not just remembering who we are as the gathering, as a church. So especially if you're checking us out, you're visiting with us, this is a great time to come and hear why we do what we do and how we go about doing. That's what this whole series is about. But my, my true prayer for this is that all of us will draw closer to Jesus because I hope that I can live a life and you can live a life that speaks long after it's over. A life that shows mercy and goodness and love and grace, just like Jesus did and just like our founding pastor did. Jesus still speaks to us today. So much so that we're going to spend the next four weeks looking at one of the messages that he gave to his people. One of the times that he stopped and spoke to them in a clear, focused way that allowed them to see the goodness of his father, our God. And he does it in, in a parable. 
Parable is just a biblical word for illustration. It's a story. It was one of Jesus' favorite sermonic devices. He loved to speak in parables because he would give this story, this illustration. The, the story wasn't true, but its essence was. What he was driving towards, what he wanted people to walk away with. And Jesus loved to give parables in kind of mixed audience. If you ever read the Gospels, which are the four books of the Bible that lay in detail out how Jesus lived and taught and died and rose again, you'll see that he speaks differently to different people. When he was with his closest followers, his disciples, he was very direct with them. He spoke in ways that were just very specific. This is what I'm doing. This is what you need to do. And a lot of times they got it. Most of the time they didn't. But when he was in a mixed audience where it was people who followed him, people who were about to follow him, people that were just kind of, the circus was in town and they just wanted to kind of check it out, and people that were his opponents, his enemies, that were kind of all out there, Jesus would toss these parables out there. To get to a truth, to, to let them know about God, but to do it in a way that anyone, no matter where they were on that spectrum, could understand and grasp what he was saying. That's what he, he's doing. And he would give these parables. And so we're going to look at, at one parable that he gave, the parable of the prodigal or lost son. It's in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 15. I love the book of Luke. It's why my firstborn son's name is Luke. It's not Luke Skywalker he was named after. It's not Luke Duke that my son was named after. He was named after the, the disciple of Jesus Christ, a, a Bible writer, Luke. And I love this book. I love what's going on specifically because chapter 15 is in there. It's an incredible chapter that lays these stories out. in this parable that we're going to spin, and it's going to be kind of our focal point this month. Because I think out of this becomes an encouragement to you personally and to us as a community. But before we kind of get to that parable, we've got to see the context. I want us to kind of go real high at first and kind of get the bird's eye view of what's going on. So before we get to the story of the prodigal son, which starts in verse 11, I want us to look at the previous chapter, just the last couple of verses of it, in chapter 14. So if you have a Bible or a tablet or a device, or if you have the worship guide that was given to you at the door, or we'll put it on the screen, the verses are there. I'd love for you to read along with me. I'll read it for us. You can follow in, in, in whatever way you, you have the Bible in in front of you. But Luke chapter 14, verses 34 and 35. I don't have time to pull them all apart, um, but I want to I wanna focus in on one thing that, that Luke says here about Jesus. It says this in verse 34. Jesus is speaking, so it says, the salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It will be thrown away. I wish we had time to talk specifically about that. Maybe we'll do a series on salt and light because Jesus talked about those very often. But notice what he says after this. He's giving a challenge to people. He's, he's encouraging those who have come to listen to him. He's, he's, he's challenging those, whether they be with him or against him, about what it is to live this life that he's calling them to. And this is what he says in response. At the very end it says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, Jesus isn't at a plastic surgeon's convention here, okay? It's not, a, it's not maybe there's a group of people who don't have ears. He's not talking literally here. All right? These people all have ears on their head. They don't have bandages wrapped around because their ears were cut off. All of them have ears. But he says, let those who have ears, let them hear. The word hear in the Greek, which was the original language of the New Testament, the word is akuo. It's where we get our word acoustic from. But akuo is the verb. It means I am hearing or the act of hearing. But when akuo is used here, it's not just listening. It's hearing so you can be changed. Hearing so you can be different. The word akuo being used here, and we're going to see it again in a second, is, is hearing so you can be converted. Hearing so you can be changed for eternity, for your life now and to come. It means to hear and believe. That's what he's driving towards here. And what I want you to do is, is look over at the very first verse in chapter 15 into the chapter we're going to be for the next month and look what happens to these people that are coming to him to hear. A kuo, to be changed, to be converted. In verse 1 it says this. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near him to hear him. 
It, it, it says that there are groups of people that were coming to Jesus. And for all of you then here that work for the IRS or you're an accountant, you're a business manager, apparently you are in your own column of bad people because there's tax collectors and then there's sinners. So those of you that, that manage the money for your business, I'm sorry, you, apparently you're screwed, all right? The tax collectors and the sinners. And it says these people, and these would be the marginalized, those outcasts, those who were least liked. In the world of Jesus, the, the Jewish people, they didn't like sinners and they really didn't like tax collectors. But those are the ones Luke tells us, and this is why I love Luke. He's very detailed. He was a doctor by trade before he was changed by Jesus and became a disciple and a writer of the Bible. He was a doctor, he was a physician, he was very detailed, very specific. And he says, these people were coming near. They were drawing near to him, he says, to hear him. The same word here is the one that Jesus has used in the verse just before. To akuo, to be changed, to be converted, to hear and believe. These outcasts, these sinners were coming near to Jesus. And what was happening is Jesus' prophecy about himself was starting to be fulfilled. When I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself, Jesus said. And it's happening here. They're drawing near to him to hear him. Because renegades will hear. Renegades will hear. And this is so important. It's not just kind of the first point that we're talking about today. This drives everything in this whole series. We have to come here to hear from Jesus, to listen to him, to believe in him. This applies for here and for everything that we do. So when you come here, let me just kind of blow your expectations up. When you come to the gathering, we're going to pray to Jesus. We're going to sing about Jesus. We're going to create environments that honor Jesus. We're going to give of ourselves and our finances to Jesus. We're going to invite Jesus to come here and lead us. And when I preach, I'm going to preach about Jesus. Otherwise, I got nothing else to say. We can just wrap this up. I, I still got an hour pregame football left. I'll totally go to that. I got to talk about Jesus. In fact, Jesus is our teaching pastor. I'm just a schmuck who shows up every so often and rambles on for 30 minutes. Jesus is our teaching pastor. Jesus is the one who speaks. And our goal here is to connect you to God. But we cannot do that without Jesus. Jesus himself said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to God except through me, by hearing me, by believing in me, by following me. Without Jesus, we can never know God. And because God loves us so much, he gave us Jesus to connect to him. That's pretty amazing. It's pretty significant. That's pretty impactful for each person, no matter where you are. Because God understood and Jesus embodied that renegades will hear. We're going to be listening. We're going to be hearing these things. And without speaking about Jesus, without talking about him, without pointing to him, change will never happen. It's impossible without Jesus. We need to hear from Jesus. Akuo, to be changed, to be converted, to put our lives with him, to put our eternity with him, to put our faith in in him, we need to hear Jesus, to akuo Jesus. Because when David would speak, some people would listen. When I speak, even fewer people listen. But when Jesus speaks, people are changed. Renegades are changed. Lives are changed. Homes are changed. Hearts are changed. But something else happens when Jesus starts to speak. Not only are renegades hearing, these people on the, the fringe are hearing and changing their lives in him. But other people are there. Look at verse 2. It says, And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Not only will renegades hear when Jesus comes around, but rivals, rivals are going to grumble. They will grumble. It says that there were the Pharisees and the scribes. 
In the world of Jesus, there was a hierarchy in the Jewish government of the, law, the lawyers, the legal people, but then there was also the Pharisees and the scribes. Their job was to interpret the, the, the scriptures and to tell everybody how they were breaking it. That was their role. Pharisees loved it. They got off on it. They loved to tell people how wrong they were and how, how messed up they were and how they'd never know God and what they had to do to get back that way. They loved telling people what to do. And the scribes wrote it all down. And here they are in the mix. Because remember, Jesus is speaking in Luke 15 to a mixed audience. There's all kinds of people from all over the spectrum. And he's speaking out to all of these people. And they start to grumble, it says, against him. What's intended here for us to know is that when they're grumbling, it's loud enough that everyone around them, whether they're with Jesus or checking Jesus out, can hear it. And this had been growing in the book of Luke. The, the Pharisees' opposition to Jesus had been growing throughout the entire gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 5, verse 3, it says that they were grumbling against Jesus, but they were doing it privately. It was a private grumbling. None of you ever do that. Luke 6, verse 7, it says they were watching Jesus. They're kind of waiting for him to make a mistake, say the wrong thing so they could pounce. In Luke eleven fifty three, 53, it says that they were forming deep grudges against Jesus. And in the chapter that precedes this one that we're going to be in all month, in chapter 14, verse 1, it says they were watching carefully. They were watching Jesus carefully. They weren't just watching him. It's carefully. They were waiting. They knew it was going to come. But now, in, in, in Luke 15, 2, they're grumbling against him publicly, verbally, saying to all who could hear, this man spends time with sinners and eats with them. It's not just bad enough he's, he's, he's inviting them in. He's eating with them. How dare he? And it like how Jesus operated with the fringe, with the renegades. He didn't like how he carried himself. If they were here today, if they kind of were like, hey, let's go, get a, let's go check out a movie. And they wander into the thoroughbred and they're like, oh, there's a church here. Let's go. They would come in here and they would hate how we do it. They would hate everything about how we're operating this morning. They wouldn't like how we go about this. They wouldn't like who we accept, who we allow in, which is everyone. They wouldn't like uh, how, we, how we do our music, how we do our greeting, that we have donuts. You know, they wouldn't like any of that. They wouldn't like how we go about it because the opposition's gonna rise. If you didn't learn that from, from our study of Nehemiah, know it now, opposition's gonna come. Rivals will grumble, whether it's Pharisees or whether it's modern-day Pharisees who don't like how we operate, how we style ourselves as a church, how we, how we speak and teach, how we love people regardless of who they are or where they come from. They definitely wouldn't like that when we gather, quote-unquote gather, as a gathering, we welcome in two types of renegades. The first type are renegades who have been changed, those of you that were running from God, he captured your heart and you gave your life to Jesus and this is how you live it out now. You're always welcome here. But the other type of renegades we welcome are renegades who will be changed because we absolutely believe that no matter what you've done, where you've been, what you're doing right now, that your life can be changed because of the love of Jesus. How deeply he cares about you. That no matter what you've done, it can be changed. Your life can be directed in a new way. A more glorious, impactful, powerful life is there for you. So we're not going to beat around the bush, all right? We're not here to entertain you. We're not here to make you feel good. We are here to let you know that your life can be changed by Jesus no matter what. But you're always welcome here until that happens. And you're welcome here after that happens. And there's going to be rivals who don't like that that's what we do. That we don't have a dress code. We don't have a no tattoo policy. Amen. That you're not allowed to, to, to come here if you don't give. That you're not allowed to come here if you're just going to eat the donuts and sneak out the door. It's okay if you just pretend to come here so you can sneak in a movie, all right? You're welcome here no matter what. The movie theater might like it, but we are okay with it. 
No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, all are welcome here because that's how Jesus operated. He gave his message to whoever would hear it because he knew if those people could hear it, they would believe and their lives would be changed. And the rivals will grumble. There will be people who grumble against how we do things at the gathering. And let me just put it out there right now. I don't care. Not one bit. I could care less what they say about me, how I operate. Ask me the questions you want to ask me. Email me when you want. You may not like my answers then, okay? Because I've got to go with what this says. And this says Jesus spoke so people could hear. And that's what I've got to do. And when we gather, we're going to lift up his name because that's all we've got. With Jesus, everything changes. And that's how we connect people to God, through Jesus, by Jesus, so people can hear Jesus. The reality is this. The reality is this. When Jesus doesn't speak, no lives are changed. No one will be changed. So we've got to talk about him. We've got to put him out there. We've got to allow him to be the one who speaks to it because I want to be changed. Whether you do or not, I want to be. That's why I show up, because I want to be changed. But I believe deep down that you do as well. We want to be changed, so let's let him speak to us. Because I once was lost, friends, and I was found. Through the mercy of God, through the love of his son, Jesus, I was found, and my life has never been the same. So as we take the next few weeks to look at Luke 15, we do it understanding that the story, the parable of the prodigal son, the lost son, is our story. It's my story. It's your story. And to set it up, Jesus gives two other parables. He gives the parable of the lost sheep. Remember, Jesus is speaking to a mixed crowd, and in that crowd are people who are grumbling against him. Out loud, he could hear it. So Jesus is like, you know what? I'm going to give them stuff they're really going to hate. And he talks about shepherds. No one liked shepherds in Jesus' time. It was seen as a dirty job. It was seen as kind of as, as bad a job as you could get. If you can't do anything else, still you don't want to be a shepherd. So he drops a parable about a shepherd on They would have hated that. And he talks about a shepherd who loses a sheep. He's got a hundred sheep. One of them goes missing. And he leaves 99 and goes after the one. And when he gets it, he puts it on his shoulders. He carries it back. Hoping the other 99 hadn't made a break for it. And when he realizes that the 99 were there and he got that one back, he puts it on. He invites all of his friends and they have a party. They celebrate. He gives that parable first. Then he talks about the parable of a lost coin. And he uses a woman who loses a coin. Because Pharisees, they didn't like women either. They didn't like shepherds. They didn't like women. They didn't like Jesus. They're like, there's a woman who loses a coin. Just one coin. And she scours her house. And when she finds it, what does she do? She goes and buys stuff with it and has a party to celebrate the coin that she lost but then spent. It shows us something. As he's setting up the, 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 the parable of the prodigal son. It shows us when in the sheep that renegades are missed. When you run, when you're not here, you're missed. I was just making a mental note during both services of some people I haven't seen this week because I just want to gonna message them today and be like, hey, I miss seeing your face. Come back whenever. I'd love to see you again. Renegades are missed, not by me and Paul, but by God, most importantly. And Jesus sets that story up saying, when you're gone, you're missed. The parable of the lost coin shows us that renegades are valuable. Your life has value. Your heart has value. Your story has purpose. Who you are is important to him. He longs to be with you again because you're valuable to him. And Jesus sets these up, giving us these tactile examples. A sheep can impact somebody's profession. A coin can impact somebody's finances. Then he drops... The last parable in Luke 15, the one we're going to study for the next three weeks, the prodigal son. He moves from sheep, which if you're a shepherd, that's going to impact you, to a coin. You lose a coin. Maybe you can work another day, get it back. But losing a child, losing family is where it really starts to come together. And the father loses a son and it breaks the father's heart because the son has fled he gets in that, he starts to dig in. 
these things missing, the sheep, the coin, the son. It's powerful. It's overwhelming to God because when those go missing, he hurts for you. Because renegades will go missing often. Not only will we hear, renegades will run. <laughs> Give us a chance. We will take off running. And to emphasize that, Jesus gives the, the, the parable of this prodigal son. It's his longest parable in all of Scripture. The longest one he gave. And it's interesting because he gives three parables in Luke 15. The one of the sheep has 103 words in it. The one of the coin has 73 words in it. But he gets to the son, he gets to somebody's child, has 491 words. Friends know this. When Jesus speaks at length about something, we should probably listen up. Heck, when Jesus speaks about anything, we should probably listen up. But definitely, for the sense of this series, when he talks at length about something, we should listen up. Because what he's telling us here is our story, your story, my story, that we have all been prodigals, renegades, on the run, not changed by God. We flee and run from it. Look in verse 11. As Jesus starts to give this parable, it says this. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give to me the share of my property that is coming to me. And the father divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and he took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. This son... This story, it's scandalous because the son, the younger son, goes to his father and says, give me my inheritance. That's disrespectful right there because an inheritance comes after you die. He goes up to his dad and is like, hey dad, if you're not going to die, go ahead and give me what's mine. But Jewish law, which is probably what this family lived under, the Jewish law, you, the younger son didn't get an equal share of the inheritance. The bulk of it went to the older son because that's how it was supposed to work under the law. So the fact that the son said, give me my inheritance early and give me half is scandalous. It's disrespectful. Not only in the way that he's going about it, but, but, but what he is saying here. Dad, I got to do for me. Give me what I need, what I deserve so I can go and make my choices. Any of you that have parented teenagers, you get this. Amen. <laughs> As they come to you, give me what I want. I know me. I'll figure it out. I'll do what I've got to do. Give me my money. Give me my stuff. Because I want to go where I want to go and spend it how I want to spend it. Because I know best. This is my story. This is your story. Because how often have we looked to God and said, God, I'll figure this out. I'll put this together. I'll sort these issues out. I'll get over those. And then I can come to you ready, right? That's how it works, right? I'll put it all together. And what we do is we get our stuff and we take off running. God has given us life and breath. He's given us love and family and we gather that up and like the prodigal son, we take off to a foreign land and what does he do with it? He spends it recklessly. He didn't just buy like a nice entertainment system. He didn't get a nice car. He essentially took his inheritance that he did not deserve, half the inheritance he did not deserve, got it early and he spent it all on scratch off lottery tickets, hoping for a break, recklessly spending it, throwing it away. Because he needed to run with what he had. Because renegades will run. I can see it in some of your eyes this morning. You're out of breath. You're sweating. Your legs are hurting. Your lungs are aching. Because you've been running for so long. Trying to put it all together. Figure it all out. Do it your way. Because nobody knows you like you, right? How's that working out for you? How'd it work out for this kid? Because inside the sun and inside all of us is this need for space. I've got to have my space. What the son did to his dad is he's basically saying, Father, you don't know best. And all the times that we run, 
renegades unchanged that we run, we're saying, God, you don't know best. You don't know my life like I do. You don't know what I need. I'll put it together and then I'll let you know when I can buzz you in, fit you in on my schedule. So he runs, the son, and so we run. Many of you today still on the run, but let me let you in on a little secret. You running renegades today, trying to get away from God's mercy and love. You're here just to appease somebody so they'll leave you alone on Facebook and stop inviting you, stop poking you. <laughs> and you're running from what God's got for you. Let me just let you know a secret. You're the ones we like best. We're so glad you're here. You're always welcome. You can always come and be a part of this. We know, we understand that you need space. That's why we don't rope off and make you sit in a certain area. You can go all the way to the back. Jenny Brinkman does it every Sunday. She puts a blanket over her. She takes pictures of blankets over her legs on the back row and she puts them on Facebook. You sit wherever you want, okay? You, 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 can, you can talk to people or not talk to people. We get that you need space. We're gonna be intentional on how we create this space so you can have the space that you need to think the things that you need to think, to ask the questions, to work through, because we're dropping a lot of stuff on you. Jesus loves me? Really? Me? Yeah. And as long as it takes you to figure that out, we'll be here with you, praying for you, speaking it again and again and again, because Jesus changes lives. Because renegades crave space. We crave that space. But we have two options. Do it the way the son did, running, fleeing, taking off and going, I'll figure this all out and it does nothing but harm and hurt him. Or perhaps we find space, space within the loving arms of Jesus Christ. I won't beat around the bush. That's the kind of space we're trying to offer here. Ask your questions, come as you are. Work through the things that you've got to work through. Ask us those questions. Ask us to pray with you. Don't ask us to pray with you. Whatever you, that's the space we're creating here to allow you to just try to put this together and allow Jesus' love to pour over you because we believe that's the space that matters most within his arms, within his grace for you. So we're going to keep talking about Jesus. Sorry. If you're like, man, I just really want to hear from God. Okay. God's name, Jesus. Well, I know that's his son. Yeah, but he's God too. Really, how's that work out? Come back, we'll do a Trinity series. <laughs> We're gonna keep talking about Jesus. I got no other material. But more importantly, we're gonna let Jesus talk as much as possible. Let him speak. Because the more we hear about him, the more we hear from him, the more our lives can be changed. Because when Jesus speaks, all those renegades that are changed and all those renegades that are about to be changed need to hear from him. So we're going to talk about him. We're going to let him talk. We're going to let him speak. And we're going to hear more and more from him because he loves you no matter what, no matter where you've been. And he wants to change your life, your destiny, your eternity, your future, your now. How deeply he loves you. So in the coming weeks of this series, we're going to look at this story, see how it applies to us, see how it applies to our church, and through it all, hear from Jesus, because that's what changes our lives. That's what changes you. That's what's changed me and is changing me. But what's most important right now is what is he saying to you this very moment? How is Jesus speaking? Not Joel or Paul or the band. What is Jesus saying to you now? You runner, you renegade. What is he saying to you? I hope you hear that you are valuable. I hope you hear that you're missed. I hope you hear that you're loved because you are. And if I haven't said that adequately, forgive me because he said it pretty adequately here and he will continue to. The more we listen, the more we hear from him the more our lives are changed. We all need to hear from him. And until the day he calls us home or comes back for us, the gathering will be a place where Jesus is talked about and Jesus is always given the opportunity to speak. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for loving us as we are, who we are, where we are.
And many of us today, God, we are fleeing, we are running, we are scared to death about what you have for us. We think we have to do it a certain way or fulfill a certain checklist or laws or rules or obligations. But God, here today, we have heard that all we need to do is hear from Jesus. That he speaks to us not only on Sundays, he speaks to us Sunday nights and Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays. He speaks to us when we're happy, when we're sad, when we're hurting, when we're broken. He speaks to us. I pray, God, now, not just for this series, but for all the Sundays going forward, that you will give us ears to hear you. And that from that will come tremendous, significant, overwhelming life change for my friends here today, many of which are hurting, many of which are running. May they find the true space that they crave within your grace, within your love. And may we, God, then take that Add that to this life of this gathering, this church, and send that message out again and again and again to those who are on the run. Jesus loves you. He misses you. He finds you valuable. God, you've called us to a great work here, but it all begins with us listening to you, hearing from you. So Father, may we do that, not just today, but in the many weeks, months, and years, the life of this church that lies ahead. I give you these people in this time and thank you for your word in this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much, so, so much for being here. Um, Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to invite you back. Uh, Next week, we're going to look, we've been talking about the renegade running. Next week, we're going to see the renegade reaps, what he reaps from this lifestyle, this reckless lifestyle that we just talked about and what comes from that and what that means for us individually and us corporately as a church and using this as an outline for who we are as renegades, who we are as a gathering of renegades. So um, we want to have you come back both physically and online. Those of you who watch online, thank you guys for, for tuning in and checking this out. It shows that you have significant technical capability. You probably have the NFL Sunday package. If you'd like to send me your, your password so I can watch some games today, <laughs> Joel P. Reynolds at gmail.com. Feel free to shoot that over to me. Be glad Obviously, you have the technical ability to do that. You can't be here, so you're there. So you probably have the, the Sunday package. So send me your NFL ticket password. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. But it's going to be a neat week next, next Sunday. It's going to be a really cool series. Um, over the coming weeks, we're going to look in detail at the, at the prodigal son. It's going to be all wrapped up with the original, the original gangsta. The original renegade, Paula Foster, is going to bring our final, final message of the series. It's going to be a really neat thing. And to prepare for that, I'm going to give you a little homework, all right? Many of you this week were reading Luke 15. That was the homework I gave to you last week. You messaged me, talked to me about it. Thank you guys for doing that. What I want you to do this week in your homework is go back and read the, the, the parable of the prodigal son, where we're spending this month. And what I want you to do is I want you to read it out loud. And anytime a pronoun is used speaking about the son, he or him, it's talking about him, what I want you to do is take that out I want you to put your your name in. I want you to make this personal because this is your story. And I want you to do it out loud, okay? So like, don't be cranking this out at Starbucks if it's super crowded, all right? Because be like, who's that weirdo? I'm never going to their church. But if it's dead at Starbucks one night, Panera, you're tucked away in the corner or just at your home, I want you to read this and I want you to put your name in, speaking about you because this is our story. As people individuals and as a church. And I want us to make it personal. So do that this week. That's your homework. You guys got it? Good. I'm gonna let you all go. Have a great week. Hail to the Redskins. See you. Bye.